Okay, good morning. We are going to change to English immediate effectively, okay? So Whenever I try to speak Spanish, my designers laugh at me. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> They laugh at me when I speak English too. Okay, so before we get started, I would like to thank uh, Victor, Pedro, Mara, and the whole Software Guru staff for making this event happen and also for inviting Wiseland to be part of the conversation. We truly believe that what we've heard before and what we're gonna be uh, hearing during the rest of the day is very important for shaping the direction of the community in Mexico. So let's give it a quick round of applause. Okay, so my name is Arturo Rios. I am a UX designer at Wiseline. I'm focused on the consulting side of the company and I've always been very curious about the intersection between design thinking, lean startup, and agile practices. And today, I'm going to embrace that curiosity. I'm going to embrace this uh, beginner's mind, which is very important in design thinking. And I'm going to interview David Ford, who was already introduced. And he is the head of design at Wiseline. He currently manages more than 15 innovation projects and a team of 35 talented designers. So David, you have 15 years of experience. And now you're here in Mexico. What is the opportunity that you see? Thank you, Arturo, and thanks to the organizers of the conference, and thank you for uh, uh, joining us this afternoon. You're being polite, it's more than 15 years. Uh, but what I found here in Mexico is a lot, uh, is very similar to what I have found always in all the other countries that I've worked, which is that there is a developing technology culture here that is um, increasingly led by design. Uh, and that's a good thing because this entire digital transformation that we are undertaking in, is really being led by people who are uh, taking the broader picture. The one way to describe UX is to say that it is uh, the art of delivering the right information and tools to the right people at the right screens at the right time. Who, who else has that job? That's our job, right? And, it, with, and we know what happens when design isn't doing that. Uh, it, the, 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 it's, it's the timing is right, and it's t the timing is right for Mexico, and it's not just because of uh, the, the Mexican national economy, though of course that's critical, and it's not just because there are uh, many um, uh, sort of favorable circumstances with respect to the proximity to markets and the proximity to partners. It's because there's talent here, and it's valuable talent, and. Uh, in, in uh, not just in Mexico, but all around the, the world, people are beginning to recognize that this is Mexico's time to shine. Yeah, I found that very interesting. We've seen these innovation hubs happening here in Mexico City and also in Guadalajara and embracing this uh, Silicon Valley DNA, right? And a lot of people moved to Silicon Valley, but you actually grew up in the Bay Area, right? Can you tell us about how that influenced your outlook? Sure, I grew up in Silicon Valley when, before it was named Silicon Valley. And so the orchards I rode through uh, on my bicycle with my friends all became, you know, startups. And uh, I was amazed by the changes in the Bay Area, the cultural changes, the physical changes, uh, the mental changes. Uh, software had a lot to do with those changes, a sense of possibility uh, that hadn't been there before. I was not an engineer, uh, but I was always curious. After college, I exercised that curiosity and I started to write about all kinds of technologies, including software. I had to be kind of dragged into software because it felt a little bit scary to me. And, but when I did do that, I found uh, all these opportunities to work with companies to help them clarify their design and their development processes. They were making software they didn't always do it the same way in, in, uh, every time, and they wanted to find what is the perfect design process and development process. Things have not changed in, in 20 years. Uh, what, except what I found then was that there was this thing getting done that sometimes was called design, but there were no designers. And so I thought, hmm, that's a good opportunity. Maybe I could become a designer. And, uh, and so th that's what I did. I, I, I began to uh, do the work that designers do. And I see that in um, that Guadalajara, uh, where I walk Ooh. around in as well, uh, uh, where WiseLine is largely based, 
it, it, there, there's that sense of excitement too uh, of making sure that we're doing uh, not just designing and developing the right thing, uh, but uh, do it in, in the right way. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges that we are still facing is demonstrating what is the value of design, right? The business value. Uh, and business is a very interesting word for business people. Let's create value, let's capture value, but still a challenge for us. In fact, we've seen a lot of reports being released by organizations such as InVision, McKinsey, Forrester, that articulate what is the business value of design in the language of ROI, or how to improve the bottom line, or how to have better time to market. But still, we see a lot of companies that are doing the hard work, they have the headcount, and there's not, they're not having the same mileage from design. So what's the secret behind these design-driven companies? It's an important question because there is great risk for companies that don't embrace design. That's another way to look at it. The companies that are embracing design are the companies that are using our abilities to the, uh, to the highest strategic value. And those companies have to not just change their product, they have to not just change their process, they need to change the way that they are thinking uh, and the way that they are interacting with one another. Uh, what this yields is an ability to be more responsive to the people that you're serving and to listen to them carefully, to interpret what they're saying and to uh, constantly measure, uh, respond and remake uh, not just your product, but sometimes your whole organization. Uh, that, that kind of ability uh, em, em, empowers companies. Now, the question is, though, how, if you're in a company that isn't in that top 5%, um, and, or you want to work for a company that is uh, in, already being innovative, how do you do that? That's, a big, uh, that's the number one question, I think, facing design right now. Yeah, and I think that how do we do that? It's been uh, another challenge. I think that as a community, we've been very active at exploring and coming up with ways to understand the most important aspect of software design and digital transformation, which is understanding humans, right? Because humans is the killer app of every software. That's the importance of being not user-centered, but human-centered. Yeah, and humans come in, in cultures. They're almost never alone. And so it's to say human-computer interaction, that sounds very old-fashioned for good reasons. We're interacting with one another, uh, and we almost pretend away uh, the, 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 we almost pretend away the computer. Um, and, uh, and that is as it should be. We've, we've always imagined these kinds of tools that we're using right now, right? Uh, that we're, we're, this happens to be the moment where they become realized, and we're never going to go back. These, uh, these gadgets that we, all, uh, that we all depend upon are an extension of ourselves and they're a way for all of us to connect. These kinds of opportunities then right now mean that uh, what we can do that nobody else can do so well is to think about the future, right? Imagine uh, uh, the, all of the ways in which people could be interacting with your business or your government agency or your nonprofit or whoever you're working for, uh, starting with those people. How are you going to be serving those people? Who's going to be serving those people? What are the implications for, the, for that level of service? And taking um, a, a service mindset uh, is, uh, is something that I've heard all morning long here. And it's very important because that's the level of, um, of, st of strategic uh, value that uh, people are looking for. And of course, you go beyond service design and you go into uh, uh, co conceptual design, UX design, brand design, these are all ways for uh, executives and other leaders in companies and, uh, to be able to visualize what it would be like uh, before you spend a lot of time in code. Designers iterate all the time so that uh, developers don't have to iterate quite so much. Okay, uh, and I think that as you mentioned and as Gabriela mentioned earlier, uh, we need, part of our job is to be facilitator of change, right? But change is a very scary word, right? If you read Kahneman, Kahneman's work, uh, we know about prospect theory and risk aversion. So changing and embracing change in our organization is really hard. We always have these siloed organizations. Everyone is incentivized in different ways. We all have different KPIs. So it's really difficult for designers to be part of a conversation. And there's always trade-offs in, in an organization. And there's product people, technical people, and they always have the upper hand. 
So how can we overcome those challenges? How can we establish a shared language where everyone has the same vote and participation? We have to practice our better Kung Fu because it is better <laughs> than theirs, seriously. Um, well, yeah, so, so these kinds of qualitative uh, exercises that we do really help ground everybody, uh, as we know. And uh, it ground them in a reality that uh, isn't all about pixels on the screen and it isn't all about developing uh, uh, features. It's, it's about the broader purpose that we all have within our business and within our community. And the best executives, they get that, right? They're visionaries as well. Uh, they, they see the greater connections. They're never content with what's just going on right now. And so I, um, the, the, the advantage that we have now as opposed to when I started, when I started, we were trying to make software better, to make it, um, to get rid of the submit button, right? Uh, we, that, 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 has, uh, that has dishonored, that submit thought button has dishonored the industry for decades. Uh, and, and when we talk about humanizing technology, that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Now we have service design in some of these more open-ended techniques. And so it's not so much making the software better, it's making our organizations and our interactions better. Uh, you mentioned service design as well as interaction design. And Cooper was one of the pioneers as, a, as an organization to embrace that mindset. Can you walk us through your experience working at Cooper and what did you learn? I, I, I started off as a writer, as I told you, and I got tired of writing about people making stuff. I got a little jealous, and so I hopped into the design race. Uh, it's probably familiar to a lot of you. Uh, maybe you didn't start off uh, in software, but here you are. And uh, what I, uh, in, I contacted Alan Cooper. He had just come out with a book called About Face. Um, when I read that, I realized uh, that I was probably the worst designer in California. And, uh, and he took me on, and uh, very early on, we started to uh, pretend that we knew what we were doing. And, it's, uh, and we, we built up our practice with the, conviction, with, the, with, uh, with the conviction that we could do better than them because we were designers. And we got business with IBM and Intel and HP and 3M, not because we had any experience, but really because we had a good attitude and a good story. Um, and, uh, and I learned mostly there that it's all about uh, the, the executive connections and the collaborations you can make with the people that you're working with to, to build things. And then everything changed when SAP sent us a letter in the mail. SAP sent you a letter. What was it about? Well, we thought it was a joke at first because they asked us to design their user manuals. All right, so um, this is 2019. We are five months into the year. Uh, how many uh, of you have consulted a user manual to use the software that you use every day? Raise your hands. Yeah, right? Oh, hey, what? <laughs> you must be a developer, right? <laughs> 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 right, so we, we, so we looked at this and we said, well, maybe they're serious about this, but maybe they aren't. And maybe what they're doing is they're fishing. They're fishing for the person who's going to say, that's the wrong question to ask. They're looking for a company that's going to say, this is the right question to ask. The question isn't about the manuals. So it not was about the manual, but improving the software. That's right. So what we, what we, what we had to tell them, uh, this happens all the time, where somebody comes proudly to your shop and they say, oh, look at my software, isn't it great? Uh, can you do a little bit to make it a little bit better? Right? They, it's like they bring in a baby and they say, isn't it beautiful? And your job is to tell them the baby's not as beautiful as they think and that <laughs> <laughs> we need to trade, right? Um, it, it, put another way, it's, what they had was dancing bearware. Dancing bearware, what does that mean? It's software that is really, really lousy, but it's like, a, it's like a, a bear in a small traveling circus that goes into your town, and you've never seen a dancing bear. So the bear doesn't have to dance so well, it just has to dance at all. 
which works until what? Until another better bird comes to town. <laughs> that's right. And so SAP recognized what we recognized, which was that they were going to get their, eat, their lunch eaten. And they were looking for somebody who would look at them eye to eye and say, let's go do this together. Let's, uh, let's get rid of the dancing bearware and let's do something uh, big with this opportunity. So Hasso Plotner, he's uh, the founder and used to be the CEO of, of SAP. And the reason I bring this up is it tells lessons. It tells lessons about executive sponsorship, right? If we're just a bunch of designers doing a bunch of design stuff, which is so great. I've never had so much fun as I've had with designers. It's not enough, right? So, so Hasso uh, uh, introduced us all his executives. We started doing uh, design and development projects about four or five a year, but that wasn't enough. It was, it was good because we got to know how everybody thought that they should be making software. We thought how, how, they, how they would like to be making software. We got to know the product managers and the lead developers. We got to know the marketing directors and the, and the partners. This is our job as, as, as software designers and experienced designers, to get to know that whole ecology. And that, was the, um, that meant then that we began to teach them how to do design. And we felt like that wasn't enough either. Uh, what we needed to do was to begin then to teach them how to teach design. And that wasn't enough either, so we decided that we needed to help them create design centers in both the United States uh, and in California. Okay, so they started SAP looking for a third-party vendor, and they found a strategic partner to not only permeate design across the whole organization, but also build these, what you mentioned, ecosystems of learning and training design in, in the Bay Area. And Hasso Plattner, uh, I think he worked with Cooper and Frog Design, and also with the Kelly Brothers to found the design school at Stanford, which has uh, his name. And the design thinking as a concept really captured the attention of executives and their imagination because it totally changed the mindset from working on tamed problems, problems that we know all the constraints, all the requirements, to wicked problems, problems that you don't know what they are until you're actually solving them. And digital transformation software problems uh, software design problems are wicked problems, right? And I think one of the challenges that we face is that we need to change the mindset of a manufacturing mindset that works on outputs, something that is a product that is produced, to outcomes. That's right. And in w w one of the most valuable things that design thinking has done for designers isn't to teach them how to do design. There's very little design technique and design process in the design thinking realm, right? But it does this really brilliant thing. It, 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 it divides the design process into two steps. It's that easy, right? You diverge and then you converge over and over and over and over and over again. That sounds iterative, because it is, and it's at iterative at every level, uh, and it's also super freaking agile. Because this is the other challenge that we have. At the same time that we're developing our methods, uh, so are uh, developers who are trying to get away from what they consider waterfall, which is you know, setting requirements, uh, designing the system, developing the system, and then a year and a half or two years later, you bring it to market and nobody wants to buy it. Right? That's a lot of effort. And so there's a lot of reasons to think in an agile method. But don't let anybody tell you that designing uh, experiences is an agile. It's the epitome of, uh, of an agile approach. Yeah, and yeah, I think software presents us with great opportunities. On the one hand, it's very complex and challenging and unpredictable. But on, on the other hand, it, it presents various opportunities. Because back in the day, we would ship software in boxes, and they would stand a shelf for six to 12 months. And if there was a problem with software, because there's always a problem with software, they would, we would need to, to wait for six months. But now we have continuous integration and continuous delivery, which is a DevOps mindset, which I think is a very strategic partner for design. And we also have software as a service, which allows us to have what Jeff Goff, Goff the author of Lean UX, calls as the two-way conversation with the market 
right? You're sensing what's happening and then you're responding with some change in the product. And that's how you embrace a mi an agile mindset. Right, because nobody wants your user manuals, nobody wants your install disks, nobody wants your mobile app, probably, right? They don't want to download it, they don't want it to be on their phone, uh, they are concerned that you're spying on them, right? They're, they don't want to pay you anything. So th these are all um, matters of importance to every company in the, in the world right now. And uh, uh, so that's where agile thinking and doing is really very important. Okay, so another challenge that we have is that we, you were looking, we were looking at the double diamond process and we as designers are always uh, brought to the conversation on the execution level. For example, Jared Spool has this beautiful definition of design as the rendering of intent, right? Making deliberate, thoughtful decisions and then manifesting those decisions. And we as designers, uh, I as a practitioner, we're all about the rendering. Pixel pushing, artifacts, mock-ups, but not so much about the intent part, the strategic part. So how can we overcome those, those endeavors? Yeah, that, that's the fundamental question. I, Mike, Mike Montero has a new book uh, about the ethics of design, which is called... Ruined by Design. Ruined by Design. <laughs> Boy, we, have all, we all have stories about being ruined by design. But he says that, that designers have uh, really two important roles in the whole process, which is to ask why and to say no. Hmm. Uh, so, so that's typically way up there in the visionary area. And, uh, uh, but you, you, you're, you earn your way up as we know, by doing all of that work. This, this big blue circle here ha is about the volume of design work being done um, uh, through 2,500 companies in the world. Most of the design is very surface level. Um, you know, can you do something to fix my baby? Um, and then level two, they realize the designers are really natural connectors, right? Um, <laughs> How many people have been in a design organization or a, a, a software product organization who, where people complain about how much the designers are laughing and having it too good of a time, right? right? We've all been in that situation. And it's, it's, it's our way of connecting and, and not just with each other but to the other aspects of the organization. And that kind of um, facility in different environments is key to what we do. Um, and then at some point they realize that we're also architects. We're experience architects, we're brand architects. We're also collaborative software architects, but in the end it's all about that collaboration. Um, we're also scientists, right? We're always doing little experiments. Sure, there's those A-B tests and, and all that other sort of analytics-driven work that we're doing all the time now, particularly in the SaaS environment, right? Um, but there's these other kind of experiments when we do are these, what do you call them, Gedunken experiments? Thought experiments. Yeah. So where we're using personas to tell stories about how things could be, fabricating uh, future realities, right? Um, and then at some point, some small 5% of those organizations that are using design, they're using them as collaborative visionaries as well. They're help we're helping them realize the future, uh, not just with pixels, uh, but with um, a, a broader mandate of, of strategic value. And guess what? People get more value the higher they go. That's no surprise, I think, to Yeah, and I believe that something that we've been embracing at WiseLine lately is this change from goals versus tasks, right? That's the whole thing about goal direction design at, at Cooper. Like, not focusing on the task. For example, going to a movie theater is a task. Uh, requesting a credit card is a task. But what are the real goals that people are trying to achieve? What are they, what, who do they want to be? Uh, what do they want to do and how do they want to feel? So can you tell us a story about embracing this mindset and st uh, striving for climbing this, this ladder? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Super une unexpected, right? <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody else here a Warriors fan? Yeah, all right. A few of us, right? What are we doing uh, next week? We're, we're going to be in the finals, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, and, but what also happens next year is that the Warriors move from Oakland, where I live, to San Francisco, where I don't, uh, 
but I work there. That's where WiseLine is, is, is incorporated. But, um, so, so they come to us and they say, hey, you know what? Uh, everybody loves the Warriors. We have this new Chase Center uh, that is going to be full of uh, Warriors games, but also all these other events, Metallica, Janet Jackson, you name it. And there's these super expensive luxury boxes that cost $2 million a year to lease, right? Um, and so, but you get to associate your personal brand or your business brand with the Warriors. Not a bad deal, right? Uh, and, but what sometimes happens is that uh, they can't f use that expensive suite every time there's an event. So there needs to be a secondary market. And people want to participate in the secondary market. Just like we have with tickets to a concert, go online and, uh, and participate in a secondary market, which is, you know, uh, uh, w which is convenient to everybody. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, what is key to any market is transparency and fairness. How do you do that? They asked Wiseline. Um, and we said, well, we, ha we don't know the answer to that yet, but we know how to get you an answer. Uh, and let's go through a design process. Let's start with uh, the brand that you need to distill and from, the cha from Chase and from the Warriors. Let's understand what the day in the life is of these people who are going to be participating in the system. Let's do some service design to clarify uh, what the implications are going to be. Uh, and uh, then let's, uh, let's develop it, right? And uh, our WiseLine developers and our WiseLine de designers are working hand in glove all the way through this effort. So it was not a just figure out the technology to enable this marketplace kind of problem, but actually a service design challenge, right? When, to the extent it's a technology challenge, it's two things. Like, do you have great des developers? And yes, we do. Um, but the other one is the service architecture, right? Literally, like, what kind of information is being served? How are payments being processed? So it's not, technology is, is, is not um, unimportant. It's just it's very particular in this case. What they understood was going to be important was the service design part. So, I, I'm, okay, I'm, um, so, so this, this, I got into this situation. We, we, you start with the... the the as is, right? So we start one morning with the as is, and I'm working with a brand new designer who's awesome, but he'd never done service design. And we were coaching him, and he did the as is on one board, and it was looking pretty good, you know? And I go back to lunch, and I come back, and we're starting the second session, which is the service design in the, you know, in the future, right? Um, and uh, M Mike decided that he didn't, he didn't want to do the second session. So he hands me the expo marker, and he says, David, you're doing this. I look at this expo marker, I look at the whiteboard, and I just see snow white, there's nothing on it. And I realized that we did a lot of service design back in the day with, uh, at Cooper, and we helped promote that as an idea, but I haven't really done it myself for a long time. And making things kind of more kind of crazy is that, okay, so there's the whiteboard over here, there was me and Mike, there was executives here, there was a table, and there, for some reason all the tech, technology and data people were on the other side of the, of the table. And so, but what you have here is everybody you need in the room at the same time. One of the greatest opportunities with service design is that you can imagine all of that uh, interactivity. One of the keys to the success of service design is to have all the actual people in the room when you're doing those exercises. It doesn't do us any good to have six or seven designers geeking out on you know, how they can communicate service design to people who are not in the room. They need to be in the room. Well, it was a little bit sweaty, right? Because Mike and I were in the, we had to create our, 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 our sticky notes and start uh, figuring out the lanes and figuring out the rows of the various actions going on. Uh, and we would spend five minutes on the first step of the day in the life, and then the two executives who were just so close, they would talk to us and say, oh, do it this way, and this thing's different over here, and then we'd talk to them for five minutes, and the tech and data people were doing the stuff that tech and data people do over there. And, th and after our five minutes of talking, then we're like, got it. We would start to do the work on the whiteboard again, and then they would turn around and they would talk to the 
data and tech people for five or ten minutes until they got tired of each other. And then they returned to us, to the next step. And we would uh, devise the, uh, uh, the service design uh, whiteboard in such a way that uh, all of the work that was being um, done on the other side of the board was reflected there. So it went like this, back and forth throughout the afternoon, four hours nonstop of, uh, of everybody building the service design um, map together. And I'll tell you that the thing, the thing is, at the end of that, we were told by the, the hardest nosed technologists in the group that we need to constantly keep that service map up to date. So as we go deeper and deeper, don't forget that you have to go back to the service design blueprint. Yeah, and I think that helped to bring shared understanding and in a way prototype uh, a conversation or, or, or a vision of a, of a service. So I found that very interesting. We're wrapping up here, so thank you very much for listening to us and thank you very much, David, for shedding some light about these topics. And uh, that's it. That's what we came to talk thank about. Thank you.